Number 1, the Joseph Johnson House or better known as simply the Castle. Beaufort's most recognizable antebellum mansion is also one of the most haunted in all of South Carolina. Although construction began in the 1850s, the house was only partially finished when it was commandeered in 1861 as a Civil War military hospital. An outbuilding behind the house served as the hospital's morgue, and bodies are rumored to be interred on the home's expansive grounds. After the house finished construction following the Civil War's end, supernatural events began to occur. Among the spirits said to occupy the property is Gauche, a French dwarf jester that came to the area in the 16th century. In 1562, the Huguenots came from France, founding the colony of Charlesfit on what is now Paris Island. It is said that Rabaul brought a dwarf along with him. It is said that Gauche made up for his lack of height by being a rough customer. He reputedly died in a battle away from Charlesfit, impaled on a pike on the land that would be the site of the home of Joseph Johnson some 300 years later. Gauche's apparition has been seen by folks as far back as Joseph Johnson himself, both inside and outside of the home. Joseph's daughter Lily played tea party with the ghost many times as a child, and visitors to the castle have seen him while on tours. Number 2, The House of Death. The structure is a famous brownstone located off Fifth Avenue in New York City and is reportedly terrorized by a whopping 22 ghosts. The most heartbreaking is the ghost of a six-year-old girl who was beaten to death in 1987 by her father, criminal prosecutor Joel Steinberg. Residents have also claimed to have seen visions of a lady in white and a gray cat. Built in 1856, it has at one time or another housed many of the city's bright and beautiful including the wife of the founder of the Metropolitan Underground Railroad and the Broadway Underground Railroad, Mr. James Borman Johnston. Johnston was responsible for founding a reading room library and the famed 10th Street Studio, a collective with studios galleries and annual funding for resident artists, unique in New York City at the time. After he died, his wealthy widow moved their daughters into the house in the 1880s. But the structure's most famous resident was Mark Twain. A legend of American literature, at the tail end of his writing career but at the height of his celebrity. Mark Twain only lived in the house for a little over 12 months. He was battling bankruptcy and churning out some of his rushed, but classic literary works. Although Twain did not have many pleasant memories of the house, he can still be seen roaming the stairwell of the house of death. Subsequent occupants have seen his visage trudging up and down the stairs, commonly considered the most haunted section of the home. He may also be responsible for disembodied marching sounds that have been heard everywhere in the vacant parts of the house. One notable Twain encounter was reported in the late 1930s. By 1937, the house on West 10th Street had been converted into a co-op building made up of 10 spacious condo apartments. Shortly after the building's transformation, a newly resident mother and her daughter bumped into Twain's ghost perched on a window seat. He nonchalantly approached the pair, saying my name is Clemens, and I have a problem here, I gotta settle. He then disappeared moments later into thin air. What problem he had that he needed so badly needed to settle, he did not share, likely a financial one. It is also a mystery as to why Mark Twain, who died in Danbury, Connecticut, not at the New York house, appears here so often. Number 3 The Molly Brown House Margaret, better known as Molly, championed workers' rights, fought for suffrage and won the French Legion of Honor Award for her help in France during World War I. But she is best remembered for surviving the Titanic sinking and she was dubbed posthumously the unsinkable Molly Brown. It is said that she, along with her husband and mother still haunt her prized Victorian home which is now a museum. Visitors claim that they have seen apparitions in the dining room, smelled mysterious pipe smoke from Molly's husband, and noticed rearranged furniture and unscrewed light bulbs. Number 4 The Snedeker House When the Snedeker family lived here in the 1980s, the drama they experienced in this haunted house, which was once a funeral home, was so bizarre it ended up inspiring a popular horror flick called The Haunting in Connecticut. 
During a two-year span, the Snedeker parents claimed to have been physically assaulted and sodomized by demonic spirits and said their son Philip was often visited by a creepy man with long black hair. Number 5. The Lump Mansion All the beer in the world won't lead to happiness. So is the case with the Lemp family who were once the purveyors of the Lemp Brewing Company, a stalwart in St. Louis before Prohibition hit. For members of the family killed themselves between 1904 and 1949, three of them inside the 33-room Victorian mansion where they allegedly still reside and haunt those who dare to stay there. The house has since been turned into a restaurant and in where you can explore the gothic arched underground tunnels and even partake in a ghost tour. Number 6, The Joshua Ward House This brick mansion, built in 1784 for prominent merchant Joshua Ward, sits on the site where High Sheriff George Corwin, who was a major figure in the Salem Witch Trials, once lived. George Corwin was the High Sheriff during the Witchcraft Trials of 1692. This important position may have been obtained through nepotism as he was the nephew of both Judge Jonathan Corwin and Judge Waite Winthrop, as well as the son-in-law of Judge Bartholomew Gedney. In his role, Sheriff Corwin escorted the condemned by cart from prison to the execution site at Proctor's Ledge on Gallows Hill. Corwin was also known as the man who used his cane to poke back in the tongue of a dying Giles Corey, one of the witches executed by piling stones upon his body. There are three ghosts now associated with the house, Giles Corey himself, the strangler who chokes visitors and the witch, who was famously captured in all her disheveled glory by a realtor taking photos at a Christmas party at the property. Number 7 The Fairy Plantation It first got its name in 1642 when the ferry boat service ran the Linhaven Waterway. The ferry operator was summoned by a signal cannon one at each of the 11 stops along the ferry route. Three of these cannons have been located. In 1828 the Walk Manor House burned to the ground. It was not until two years later that George and Elizabeth Walk Mackintosh built from the good bricks of the Manor House, the house that stands on the plantation today. It was built for their Charles Fleming Mackintosh. At the beginning of the Civil War, he and his family were against secession. However, as many Virginians did, when Virginia seceded, Charles resigned his United States Navy commission and was commissioned by the Confederate Navy to be captain of the CSS Louisiana. Ferry Plantation is currently being renovated by the Friends of the Ferry Plantation House, in partnership with the city of Virginia Beach. The house is open to the public as a museum for tours and educational center. Because the structure was built on Native American hunting grounds, this home's got a raft of ghosts, from passengers of a shipwrecked ferry to a boy who fell from a window. Many have watched the ghost of an enslaved man walk across the room and tend a long boarded up fireplace. Another paranormal presence is Grace Sherwood who was accused of witchcraft in the 1700s and found guilty by ducking which is a process in which she was bound and dropped in deep water, drowning would mean she was innocent. Thankfully, after seven years in prison she was released, and in 2006 she was officially exonerated. Number 8 The Farnsworth House Inn The house is named in honor of Brigadier General Elon John Farnsworth, who led an ill-fated charge after the failure of Pickett's charge, claiming the lives of Farnsworth and 65 of his men. The original part of the house was built in 1810, followed by the brick structure in 1833. The house sheltered Confederate sharpshooters during the three-day conflict, one of whom it is believed to have accidentally shot 20-year-old Jenny Wade, the only civilian who died during the battle. More than 100 bullet holes pocked the walls. Following the battle, the house served as a hospital. It is said that the house is still haunted by the ghosts of long-dead Confederate soldiers. Number 9 The Franklin Castle Also known as the Tiedemann House, this mansion was built from 1881 to 1883 by German immigrant Hannes Tiedemann. He built his grand house on Franklin Boulevard, not only to provide a more upscale residence for his family, but also to provide a temporary place for friends, family, and others emigrating from Germany to stay when they first arrived in Cleveland. 
the house replaced an earlier house on the property which was raised during the construction of the new house. Tiedemann tragically lost four of his children. Hannes, his wife Louise and their two surviving children, August and Dora, moved into the new house in 1883. There, the two children grew to adulthood. Both children later married and provided Hannes and Louise with a total of six grandchildren. Hannes Tiedemann sold Franklin Castle in 1896, just one year after his wife Louise died. In the century that followed, the house saw many new owners and several new uses. From 1921 to 1968, the house was known as Eintracht Hall. During these years, it was the home of the German-American League for Culture, an ethnic cultural organization that, in its early years, was involved in political causes, and, in later years, functioned as a German singing club. Beginning in the 1960s, the then-owners began to say it was haunted by Hannes's wife and one of the daughters who died before the house was even built. There are hidden rooms and ugly rumors about Hannes as a murderer, crying babies, organ music, ghosts who snatch blankets off you at night and more. One owner of this most haunted house in Ohio was Judy Garland's last husband. Number 10, The Conjuring House. Located in Harrisville, Rhode Island, the home is a small, humble farmhouse that dates back to the 18th century. Shortly after the Perone family, which consisted of a couple named Carolyn and Roger and their five daughters, moved into the home, they noticed strange things happening inside. At first, a broom would move from place to place on its own, and small piles of dirt would appear on freshly cleaned floors. In 1974, Ed and Lorraine Warren were called in to investigate as the situation had become far more frightening. The five Perone daughters were being awoken early some mornings by alleged spirits, who smelled like rotting flesh and lifted the girls' beds. The mother of the family, Carolyn Perone, reportedly researched the home and learned that it had once belonged to the same family for eight generations. Chillingly, many children in this family had purportedly died in or near the house under strange and disturbing circumstances. According to Carolyn's research, some of the children drowned in a nearby creek, others hanged themselves in the attic, and at least one was murdered. Although the parents allegedly encountered numerous spirits while living in the farmhouse, one of the angriest was a spirit named Bathsheba. Most terrifying, there was a real woman named Bathsheba Sherman who was said to live on the property in the 19th century. Some believe that Sherman had been a Satan worshiper or a child murderer. Lorraine Warren was quoted in a 2013 interview saying, The things that went on were just so incredibly frightening, it still affects me to talk about it today.